The Man in Line with Andy Wint. First of my good afternoon. Welcome to Man in Line on Manx Radio. Text one double six one double seven. Also WhatsApp, same number. Email studio at manxradio.com. Call sixty six thirteen sixty eight for whatever's on your mind. We are an open line today. You may want to follow up on uh, anything you heard yesterday from Chris Thomas, MHK, Department of Infrastructure Minister, and Gary Cobb, the Airport Director. Lots and lots to unpick from what happened yesterday and many, many messages uh, that we couldn't read out of there because we were absolutely uh, stacked out yesterday. But uh, I'll just uh, run through a few of them uh, as to uh, what was uh, what was g- going to be used. Uh, could you please force cafe operators to use crockery and not wasteful and environmentally unfriendly paper cups with plastic lids. We're a UNESCO biosphere. Government has a single-use plastic strategy and the airport should deliver on this. It was interesting yesterday just to see what the airport actually did and what it contracts out. And of course, one of the things it contracts out is catering. And, and what exactly we should do with uh, what is, in effect, a restaurant. Remember, it used to be a pub inside the uh, the airport at one time. There was a part of it, uh, the back part, that was, was just a pub. I just wonder whether you think that we should be doing something with that. And certainly, we've got about 20 weeks left before single-use plastics are finished. And presumably, that will include plastic lids to hot drinks. So we won't be having those. Is it time to bring back good old crockery and glass bottles, perhaps? There, thanks to that uh, texter uh, 637. It was uh, fascinating listening to Man in Line regarding the airport, says Jane. Um, good qu- questions answered. I'm flying to my daughter's wedding next week in Turkey, but we're having to spend two nights in Manchester because of EasyJet's unreliability. So <laughs> that isn't good, is it? And is there any chance of removing those dreadful stickers on the arrival windows, please, Uh, says Grieber. That was a Facebook message that we got him. Uh, We didn't quite get to that, but uh, one thing that you will notice if you go to the airport, there's an awful lot of advertising around the airport that is sold uh, very effectively by, I think, probably the biggest advertising agency on the Isle of Man, Isle of Man Advertising, responsible for that. It's a public domain. If you go to Isle of Man Advertising's website, Uh, click on the bit that says advertise at the airport, you'll see roughly how much they're selling the advertising for. And uh, by my calculations, if they sell everything, all the boxes and all the advertising hoardings at uh, the rate that they advertise, it looks like there's about £300,000 worth of advertising at the airport. So government will be taking a a big slice of that, and no doubt there will be an advertising agency commission. Uh, But uh, obviously the advertising that the government receives from from that is... uh, a big part of uh, what they get, but that's. Uh, but uh, you can take a look; it's all in the public domain. Uh, and w- w- why uh, the problems with the airport weren't sorted out when Anne Reynolds was director? Uh, are they new problems? Says Dave. We'll come to that, and certainly I think they'll be both back on Man and Line before the end of the year. Chris Thomas uh, certainly is infrastructure minister and hopefully Gary Cobb. But it was interesting to hear what was said yesterday. Now, if you're in Peel, you'd be interested to know that Peel Commissioners has agreed to demolish the Riot Aylin housing estate. Hazel Hannan, of course, former MHK, Hazel is the new chair of Peel Commissioners. And she says the local authority had a great deal of concern over Riot Aylin, but says it's for the best. She says, like other issues, like the development of the new sewage plant it's not in their hands so 
what uh, what does Hazel Hannon think about this? Very proud, yes. I have done it before. I think I had 10 months because of COVID, and, but yes, it's it's great being being back in the chair. What issues or what key things do you think are facing Peel residents at the moment that you and the board need to focus on? Well, there are some things that are out of our hands completely, which uh, the sewerage is one, and it now actually looks as if it's going to be taking place in their proposed site. Obviously, you've got to have planning, and it's going to be a long way yet uh, to go before it's it's final. But I'm ever hopeful that that's where it'll be, and it, we'll be able to treat sewerage, and we'll have a wonderful bay again. We have a lot of social housing in Peel, and we have one particular estate which has got uh, serious issues, and um, we have we have decided whether it will happen or not, we have decided that we would like to see them demolished and rebuilt uh, because they're about 30 years old and um, it's a great deal of concern for us that this has happened to the people that are living there. But we need to make sure that places are uh, satisfactory for people to live a healthy life and this is what they haven't got at the moment. We have been doing quite a lot of work on uh, climate change. Some people think that we, you know, we're only small and but one little bit adds up to another little bit and it all makes a big pond at the end and um, so we're all doing our our bit and um, we're trying to do rewilding as well and so it's it's changing um, the attitudes and and our policy too um, to the wider environment. And what kinds of things have you got lined up for the rest of the year? Obviously, residents and obviously visitors look forward to. Oh, well, we have a we have a committee that plan sort of all of that. So we're just gearing up now for TT, and I think everything's in place. Well, hopefully everything's in place for TT, and then after that we've got carnival, we've got traditional boat weekend, we've got markets throughout the summer. So yeah, yes, yeah, it's quite there's quite a lot of activity here. At there the she moment. is, uh, the uh, new chair of uh, Peel Commissioners. That's uh, Hazel Hannon. And, uh, well, the demolition of Riot Ailing Housing Estate. If uh, you're in and around, how do you feel about that? What's going to happen? Uh, roads close, by the day. If you haven't quite checked today, roads close at uh, 4.45 from Barul Park in Ramsey, f- uh, 5 o'clock from the bungalow, and 6 o'clock everywhere else. So if you're flying home tonight, metaphorically speaking, that's what you need to do. 4.45 from Barul Park, Ramsey, 5 o'clock at the bungalow, <coughs> excuse me, and 6 o'clock everywhere else. Um, of course, on Monday we had all day, <coughs> all day practice. How do you feel? It was the first time, all day practice on Monday. How do you feel about that? Well, if you liked it or didn't, you got the same again this coming Friday. Uh, let's get to the lines now. Roger's first on today. Hi, yeah. Roger. Hi, good afternoon, Andy. Um, I, I was on the, in the queue yesterday. Unfortunately, didn't get to, to speak to either to Gary or the minister, but um, I just wanted to uh, follow up as, as several people in relation to the airport uh, and Gatwick. And this was a personal experience and I'm going back now, but this was senior race day last year, so almost, almost 12 months ago. Um, and I don't think a lot of things have changed since then. But the experience I had, um, I had um, three three lads stay with us for uh, for the TT. And at 6 o'clock on the Friday on, on the senior race day, they got a text from, or one of them received a text from EasyJet that the flight had been cancelled. It was scheduled for nine o'clock from the Isle of Man uh, to Gatwick. Um, they, they, I think part of the text um, advised them to go onto the app and ring the number. That, that continually rang out, and their families in the UK in the Kent area, they were also ringing with, with the same, same result. Um, so what was interesting, what, what blew out, what came out of that was they went down to the airport um, to speak to EasyJet um, at the desk there, customer service. And the first thing they found out was the girls there said, that actually, they're not customer service EasyJet. They just wear an EasyJet T-shirt for the check-in. And at the end of the check-in period, they, they revert back to maybe another airline or, or, or whatever it is. But they're not specifically uh, employed by um, EasyJet in respect of customer service. But what they did tell them was the next available flight was the following Thursday. 
six days later. Crikey. Yes, yeah, six days. And, and they, they were at that stage were out on a limb. They could give them no further advice, no assistance or, uh, a, you know, potential um, B&Bs or, or, or anything for accommodation. And um, what they did is um, they, they actually got a taxi, their choice. I was happy to put them up until the next Thursday, you know, to stay with us. We wouldn't see them on the streets. But they went down to um, uh, Douglas. Uh, they trawled the, the streets, bearing in mind it was senior race day, so it was quite busy. They did manage to get overnight accommodation and then went to the ferry at 5.30 the next morning, got a sail into Haysham and made their way down after a few changes to Kent and um, got there in, in the evening. On that Saturday morning, I went to the Welcome Centre because from memory there was a, um, a statement on, on, the, on Manx Radio, on the news during that week because there'd been a number of uh, Gatwick cancellations, or sorry, uh, EasyJet cancellations. And the statement from the minister at the time said that all help would be given to, to people that were stranded. They, they, there was nothing, there was no help. And as was mentioned yesterday, either by Gary or, or Chris Thomas, it wasn't just a case of, oh, get in a hotel for the night and send a claim in. This was, we were talking about six nights. A lot of people wouldn't have the money to stay another six nights. So that, that's the uh, situation. They were lovely lads, enjoyed it, but they're not coming back. It's they interesting. I mean, of course, there's always a logistical hurdle to overcome when you're going off the Isle of Man or getting back to the island. There's residents, mm-hmm. we understand that. We know the planning it involves. Sometimes <clears throat> it's like a military exercise. But of course the worst thing happens as you, as you detailed. When things go badly wrong, when it's at a pinch point and as you say, that will put them off for life now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's a, they, the, one of one of the lads. Their family were due to come uh, this TT, but they they, they cancelled on the strength of that. It was no reflection on us, yeah. no reflection on on the Alaman. It was just the, the situation that they found themselves in. You uh, ju- you just wonder how much the government could or should do to mitigate those circumstances. Yeah, and 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 honestly, if if there was. There was nobody in authority that we could or I could uh, reach or they could reach that could give them any guidance. They really were on their own. Um, and you know, the three youngish lads, they, they, they found their way back to um, to Kent eventually the, by the following evening. And but, I think that's, the, that's the, the nub of this, Roger, that, as you say, they were on their own. And, and the place probably seemed a bit inhospitable. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, you know, it's coincidence, but the timing, it was six o'clock. They'd been here for the week. It was almost like, OK, we've, we've got what we need out of you now. And, and now, no, n- n- there was no interest. I, I, I just felt so stupid that I was trying so many different avenues yeah. to try and... Um, throw some light on just to get some guidance and there was nothing nothing at all and even from the uh, you know the the place you'd expect the welcome center you'd expect something Um, it was too late then they'd already left but I tried to find out what you know if if that was to happen again where should I turn and as you say as a resident you kind of shrugging your shoulders and smiling nicely but you know there's a feeling of helplessness inside you very much so extremely so yeah yeah and i I felt so so bad um on behalf of of the island you know um you know we 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 were the hospitality um we we, it was ruined for them anyway um apart from the the fact it was cancelled as well but uh they, they were just stranded i don't know if they hadn't had the initiative to uh, to go down and, and literally walk the streets of Douglas the prom what do you pick out what do you pick out of the bones of what uh, what we heard yesterday from uh, Chris Thomas and Gary Cobb well I, I, I honestly felt they weren't re- in touch with reality I could give you another example with the uh, with the taxi service um, we came back from a long-haul holiday 
and there were there, there there was a queue of people, but there wasn't a taxi. Five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes, and I went to the the airport desk for uh, some advice. They they gave me a slip of paper with three telephone numbers on. Balasala, Port Arain, Port St Mary. All three of those numbers rang out, no reply. Yeah. I rang Douglas, and they said, yes, we can get you a taxi there within 50 minutes to an hour, but you will have to pay from the taxi from Douglas to the airport. And this is because of the Malou plate Well, I, I, I learned that yesterday, at yeah, the Malou plate. I, there, there was nobody there at all. Uh, but that Malou plate must be legit in Douglas because... On the way home, we um, spoke to the taxi driver, and he said, hey, you've got no chance on a Saturday evening. The money's in Douglas, not the airport. His words. Wow. So I presume that they, they're legit to uh, operate it in Douglas. OK. Roger, thanks for calling today. All right. Take care. Good Stay to hear from you. Thanks uh, for, for that. Tony's with us now. Hi, Tony B. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, we're getting, it's getting a bit disgraceful. The government and everybody else keeps jumping on and saying how wonderful everything is. And we're working on this, we're working on this, but we're asking for people's opinion. But in reality, they're actually not listening. And that's across the board. And what I was coming on today for, I've just been there, I've been looking for, trying to find the schedule of road closures. Now, they used to be published every year. Without failing the courier. It did. Everybody used to cut the, uh, cut that out and put it on, yeah, on the kitchen exactly. notice board. Right. Have you got one? Uh, I'll be honest with you. We've had them printed out uh, within the radio station because uh, we couldn't find one online. Right. So my question is, one, why hasn't it been published in the newspapers? Which is, as far as I know, is a statutory requirement by DOI. You can't close roads without telling everybody. If you go on the DOI website, you can't find it. You can find a PDF, but you can't find the road closures. But it's actually on Facebook. You have to go in there and download the PDF to see it, and then, of course, you'd have to print it, which is not a very good use of anything. I've just been to the bank, and the bank have said, oh, yeah, there's a flyer here. It's on the, it was on the desk. I said, oh, where would you get that from? We printed it off Facebook because a lot of people we understand don't have Facebook. So as a courtesy, the bank is handing these out. Why doesn't the government, as a courtesy, do what they should be doing, which is letting everybody know when the roads close? And the other thing is the road closures from the TT website don't agree with the DOI ones. So the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. And as usual... If you are old or older and you don't use Facebook by choice, you're left out, which seems to be the way the government moves. Everything is on Facebook because I, I don't know whether somebody's paying them for it or what, but Facebook steal data and information without a doubt because they've been fined and fined and fined. They still do it. But the people of the Isle of Man deserve better from DIY as far as communication is concerned. You uh, you lobbed so, in a grenade last thing yesterday, uh, Tony, and you said the government should buy an airline. Correct. Yeah, I agree they should. Right. I don't think they need to go out and buy a giant size airline, but if you had your own airline, which ran beside the existing ones, which is quite possible, you can do that. It's, this open skies policy is a choice. You can buy your own airline, still have, let other people fly here. It's not a problem. Other people used to fly here when Manx Airlines was flying. And it worked fine. The point of having your own airline is you have what's called reliability and you have control. And what we seem to be doing as a country, every department in the government, is moving that control and that reliability offshore, away from us, in other words. It falls into everything that happens. We'll pay airlines millions of pounds to make keep flying here when we need them to, but we won't invest that money in an airline. And you can make the airline semi-commercial. You could put it out and say, OK, who's willing to support this? We'll make it a commercial venture, but it'll be supported by government. Well, the... Um 
the, the uh, template that people always use is uh, Origny, Air Origny, the Alderney airline that Guernsey um, uh, bought and fund, uh, which obviously Ooh. operates in the Channel Islands. Uh, that, that loses money, though. Yeah, but the airport's losing money. <laughs> Ask yourself, right, you've got an airport that doesn't work half the time. Why doesn't it work half the time? Because there's not enough staff to keep, to keep it going. So really, if you had more volume, you could have more staff. And the other end thing is obviously the upgrade that we spent millions on making the runway longer and have given them an air, uh, a, a tower that's the size of Blackpool doesn't work because we haven't got an instrument landing system. This was one of the first places in the world to have instrument landing, the Isle of Man. And we've just let it go, as usual, because the government and the departments who they get this expert information from don't know what they're talking about half the time. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. And I'm not trying to pick it on individuals. The government needs to be a bit more hands-on with what's going on and have a clear picture of what they want to do. Instead of running round after climate change and carbon neutral issues, we should be focusing on the day-to-day -day stuff that people live with. So some old age pensioner drives all the way from Ballure or somewhere down to, down to Douglas, gets charged for parking and then finds out the flight's not arriving. Mm. It's appalling. And I don't, I don't say that buying an airline's the ideal solution, but it's one of the solutions. We bought a, we bought a steam packet. It took us nearly 30 or 40 years to buy that, because when I was a kid, I remember it being discussed at the time. Shall we buy the steam packet? And we had Manx Airlines. It was offered for a pound. It was, was wasn't it? Enough. Yes, it was, and got turned down. Yeah, and where are those people now? that turned it down. They're all pulling in a nice big fat pension and sitting doing nothing. So I, I just think there's the voters of the Isle of Man are getting more and more fed up with the government performance, but the government is just ignoring us. They're not listening at all. You know, the, the idea that you shouldn't drill thermal wells because it's got no history. Thermal wells have been drilled for years. Not one or two, years and years and years. And the reason they're more ideal now is because you have a fuel crisis, a gas crisis, because of the war in Ukraine, because of Russia's intent on taking over half the world. It's not getting better, it's going to get worse. So you need to have independence in water supply, you need to have independence in electricity supply. And relying on an under, underwater cable for 200 million is not the ideal thing to do. Spend the 200 million on homegrown electricity and supply. And basically, reliability. And also, another interconnector will take the best part of a decade, even if we started negotiating today. And when you think about it, Digging up the seabed and laying an interconnector cable is not the ideal thing for the marine environment, is it? They'll have massive problems doing this, and they won't listen, because it's easier to say, oh, we'll put an interconnector in 10 years' time, it's not my problem anymore, rather than doing something now that says, we can do this in five years' time, and in five years we'll have a reliable source of energy. Okay. I mean, you had on last year a guy for the water. I hope he's coming back this year when they put the hose pipe ban in, which they will, to tell us what he's done about using Lurgy Thistle water, as, as he calls it, Balua water, which is just let to run in the sea all the time. Okay. It's, it's just appalling. There, there is no joined up thinking. The government doesn't care about anybody who's not on the internet are running Facebook. All right, Tony, thanks for calling today. I just speak for all the older people. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Take care. Good to hear from you. Uh, thanks for that. Ken's on now. Hi, Ken. Oh, afternoon. Um, the road closures was in the Courier Friday, May the 12th, which included the Southern 100, funny enough. 
which is all right. And also, the police station had them on the counter, the printed copies. Which police station? The main re- Peel, of course. And they were just on the counter and just picked them up. Um, how many... I don't know how many houses in the estate that the commissioners are going to knock down. Where uh, re- are the people going to live? In the meantime, you mean? Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. How many houses are there at Rear Tailing? A couple of dozen? Probably, yes. I don't, I don't know the exact figure, but... Um, I just wonder how much, it, how much it's going to cost. I know there was something in the wind about um, repairing them or not repairing them, but they decided to knock them down. But well, they're only 30 adult. years old. Yes. Um, having lived in, living in a house that's 110 years old, it's a terrace house, but nobody builds terrace houses anymore because everybody wants gardens and a garage and a forecourt. But uh, I don't know whether anybody's come up with any figures as to how much it would cost to repair or the running repairs and how much it's going to cost to rebuild them. And whoever's going to build them, of course. And we get round to what I don't know if anybody's made up their mind what they're doing with the Douglas Flats on in Lord Street. Uh, no, nobody... Well, they're boarded up now. They look uh, like something from a kind of horror movie set at the moment because there's no life within them at all. So who knows what's going... There are all sorts of... There's all sorts of skeet going around about what's going to happen to them, but uh, no plans at the moment. No. So, um, don't know. Just It just seems strange to knock down a house and say it's only 13 years old and... When they built right in the first place, then. OK. All right, Ken, thanks for okay. calling. Cheers. Good Bye. year. And thanks to all the other people who called in to say that uh, the road closures were in the papers. Uh, <laughs> thank you to Dennis, who sent me a, a shoal of information just to say EasyJet is in debt. Uh, the total debt on the balance sheet of September last year was $4.81 billion. According to EasyJet's latest financial reports, uh, the, that's the total debt, $4.81 billion dollars and uh, that's the sum of all current and non-current debts and easyjet reported in april of this year a headline pre-tax loss of 545 million pounds for the first half of the fiscal uh, 2022 they said they expect to report revenue for the period of uh, 2.69 billion pounds compared to 1.5 billion the year before so um are easyjet making money where are they uh, there are all sorts of rumours that I alluded to yesterday that obviously Ryanair, the uh, the uh, the sword of Damocles that is Ryanair, that's hanging over everything where that's concerned. But um, it's interesting. I don't know what your thoughts are regarding EasyJet and the fact that that late Gatwick flight just seems to be the source of all sorts of uh, calamity for many people. When it works, it's brilliant. But even last night, it was, what, an hour late. Howard's with us now. Hi, Howard. Hello, Andy. Um, I tried to get on yesterday and ask the um, the minister if, um, like, so my wife was going. Well, I was going with her uh, to a hospital across. This is from the back end of last year up until recent. And um, when we drove, we, cho- we choose to use our own car to go down because of the convenience, and we can park down there. And I didn't mind this one iota. Um, when we pulled in. I didn't use the the app. I went into the desk, and it was ten pound for sixteen hours, which, in all terms, is cheap. But if this and um, when it comes in, the new charges that exact same period of time and everything, we've gone up to fifteen pound. Uh, so. Um, I don't know whether they're trying to chase people out of the car park there and to use the buses, or they're just being greedy, because that is an awful charge, an increase in charges for exactly the same period of time. It was 16 hours, as I say, which was 7 o'clock out in the morning and hopefully 7 o'clock back at night. Have they painted the parking lines, the spaces yet? I don't know, because we had to cancel the last appointment. My wife wasn't well. Um, so I haven't been down, but they were not, well, they were there, but they were very faint and um, illegible. So again, uh, as I said to you once before, if there's no parking space, it's clearly marked. How can they have an offence been committed? But one of the other things, and it's only just been a couple of lines in the paper, uh, and this is another question I was going to ask Chris Thomas, and possibly um, Cobb, Mr. Cobb, the 
uh, saying about EasyJet and the number of people they want to increase traveling to the Isle of Man up to 500,000 a year. And they're looking to use larger aircraft. Well, has the DOI, which is, operates the airport, plans on resizing the airport for a bigger aircraft? I remember, um, and it wasn't, it was on rare occasions we used to get the charter jets in and the biggest one I've seen and um, serviced was a 757 uh, and that was doing a direct flight out I think it was to Tenerife or somewhere but to get an equivalent jet that size in uh, on a regular basis you'd have to do major work to the airport for the, the runways etc uh, and I was wondering whether the DOI had plans in the pipeline because Looking at the farce of the promenade and the Liverpool landing stage, God help us if they started working down there and um, they had to shut the airport for about three years. What I was trying to find out yesterday, and we were we were we were absolutely stacked out with requests and calls and what have you, but uh, there seems to be <coughs> that the the airport isn't what isn't what it used to be, Howard. You know, no. this, we used to go to a lot more destinations. We had Ma uh, Manx Airlines, which Everybody used to moan about the price, but it was always very reliable. That's uh, always what I say, be careful what you wish for, because people are ripping the back out of Manx Airlines at the time, and they did provide a good service, and they had a good fleet, a very young fleet, what you refer to, uh, at the time with the ATPs and the 146s. And um, the steam packet were the same. And they kept, people kept ripping the back out of them, ripping the back out of them. Oh, until the Howard, I remember. Going. I mean, I came to Manx Radio 25 years ago this October, which, which was just after the Ben McCree had, had been commissioned. Mm -hmm. Everybody hated the Ben McCree. Yep. Uh, and we, it was the man in line was full of it. And that, and talking about Manx Airlines, how expensive it was, even though they had their deals, the fair cracker and things like that. Mm -hmm. And of course, we never looked. We never looked beyond that with Manx Airlines. No, uh, Manx Airlines provided an excellent service. They had a base here where they had. Um, well, they built those two hangars down yeah. there at the airport. Employed hundreds of people. Exactly, and um, they provided a service that was second to none. But then um, they decided, in their wisdom, at the airport, the management and the bosses that they were going to outsource it, and this is what happens. The outsourcing does not have the island um, form of mind, the mind, the, this is an island, and they'd be flying to a European destination, the majority of them, and they're not particularly interested in people here. But if they're talking about getting more people here, why don't they put more services on instead of larger aircraft and then going down the road of having to expand the airport uh, to a, a, a adopt to these um, larger... Because the one equivalent, I looked it up yesterday, the equivalent would be a 321, uh, the, which is the larger version of what uh, EasyJet are using. They use the 320. They do have 321s, but... That is the equivalent, the modern equivalent mm. of the 757. And that's what you would have to have if you're going to increase the number of people. But we used to have them coming in, and they used to have coach services from, and you remarked on it last couple of weeks, down at the bus service. They had coach services running in and out, in and out, and then the government and themselves made it difficult for the taxis at the airport, and they just disappeared. So... It's the, you know, it's the thinking behind the government mm. that's holding everything up. And um, they just want the buses, buses, buses. Interesting. Uh, and the, the, it's a port. We have two ports on the island. We've got the, 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 uh, <laughs> the link spans in Douglas and we've got the airport at Ronald's Way. And two vital points. And surely they should be a source of national pride. They used to be. They used to be, but then... Um, Certain individuals moved in in the hierarchy, not only in the government, but actually in the airport itself, and decimated. We used to, I was only remarking the other day, we, at this time of year, we would have anything up to 100, 100 plus light aircraft coming in from Switzerland, France, Germany, all over. And they'd park up down where the jet centre is now, and down right down at the far end by the fire station, 
and then they decided we no longer want them. And that was 100 customers a day that airport was losing in light aircraft. And they used to take off. It was just like... Um, aircraft there within the last war they were taken off in, in rows and rows and rows and off to, and these people used to spend money here and they pay but no they killed it all off on the fact that they wanted to be like a real airport and it's disappeared that real airport no longer exists well it's, you're, it's you're not the out. first person to bring up the subject of them not wanting general aviation or wanting to uh, make it difficult for general aviation. Yeah. Um, well, as I say, they, I, I, I can remember them. Uh, the best I think we had was about 120 aircraft all parked down there. And they'd come in and go out the same day or they'd stay for two or three days. And that was all finance coming into the airport. But they wanted to look like a real airport. I remember those words. Uh, because we we serviced those aircraft, and that was suddenly a, a large amount of money that disappeared from the coffers. It was a sad day when it happened, but that was the that unfortunately was a, the train of thought that went through the the management, the operation side of it, and everything. And they quite literally killed the pride in the airport and the men that were working down there. Okay, Howard, I appreciate your call today. Thanks for being with us. Take care. Bye now. Uh, good to hear from you. It's 18 minutes before one. Jason Morehouse, uh, the Arbury Castle Town and Maloo MHK, is putting forward a motion in Tinwell to make the owners of run-down buildings pay higher rates on properties that are uninhabitable. Jason Morehouse says that owners of these buildings should no longer have their rates payments suspended. In fact, they should pay more. He's suggesting an increase of 20% compounded to try and encourage homeowners of dilapidated houses to renovate. Now, a local democracy reporter, Emma Draper, has been chatting to Jason. It's a solution that is doable and it's actually got a cost involved so the people who've got property are going to think, oh, this is worth doing. And it's also getting rid of that issue within the neighbourhood. It's not a common problem in Arby Castle Malu, but it's an ongoing one. And it's one I'm probably contacted at least every four or five weeks about. And it's made especially frustrating if you've got an empty house or other building that is looking unattractive and potentially dangerous and then the owners ask for their rates to be removed you think oh this is especially bad because you've got something in the community which is negative and in a way you're benefiting because you're actually having to contribute back to the community so I thought as a starter this motion has a lot of positives and it'll be interesting to see how Comey respond in terms of can we tweak this and take it forward or can we take it forward as it is you know, Chris Thomas has spoken frequently about these 6,000 empty houses out there and getting them back into usage. And this looks like one way of getting many of them there, especially the worst ones that upset and offend people. Is this something that the local authorities in your area, something they come to you about? Yeah, it's been an ongoing situation. And it's one of those things that if I have a concern raised, I go back to the commissioners because the commissioners actually deal with this. And then I have my meetings with environmental health and things and then go back to the commissioners and the commissioners send the letters out and the commissioners are kind of despairing to do all the work and then up comes the letter from the treasury saying that from the 1st of April whenever this owner will no longer be paying rates and it comes down to basically because she can't actually live in that house it's not habitable and why isn't it habitable it's because it's been left for so long or they've actually taken action to make it unhabitable if I've got someone complaining about a building and at the same time the building's owners are just saying well we maintain it in a safe way but they're not contributing to the community the rates payments something's wrong and needs to be looked at if this did go ahead what would you want to happen with the buildings would you want them to be sold on to local authorities so they could become social housing i think that's really down to the owners to decide i think this is all this can do is give those owners whoever's owning the land that nudge to actually do something because at the moment with the rising house prices you've got a situation where the longer you actually hold on to that property for the greater the returns you get even though it may be crumbling and run down and unattractive as a base value that's going to be going up what do you think about this that's jason morehouse mhk arbury castle town and maloo about dilapidated properties getting rate relief do you think it's now time to squeeze the owners of those dilapidated buildings and just say pay more or sell them and we could get some of those six thousand empty properties back into use 
you'll find Subway cafes in ShopRite, Port Erin and Peel offering the very best of Subway. Delicious six-inch and foot-long subs, breakfast meal deals, signature wraps and salads, as well as gourmet coffee, tea and treats. How about a free drink with any foot-long sub? Complete with a smiling welcome and speedy service. Grab and go or chill out in a relaxed cafe environment. The choice is yours. Head to Subway and ShopRite, Peel and Port Erin. Ramsey, Douglas, Castletown and Peel, the Ferry Bridge and Laxey Wheel. Point of air to the sound of man. Explore the island with Camperman. Whether it's an island staycation, a trip to the UK or a tour of Europe, do it in style with Camperman Luxury Motorhome Hire. Fabulous accommodation, the open road and stunning views await you. Start planning your dream adventure. Call Camperman Luxury Motorhome Hire now on 30 40 87 or find us on Facebook. Want to make a real difference to your home or workplace energy bills? The team at EMS Home Green have 30 years experience supplying and installing solar power and thermal systems, air and ground source heat pumps and battery storage. A complete one-stop eco shop, finding practical solutions to help you save money from day one. Call 613-210 or visit ems.co.im to arrange your no-obligation survey. EMS Home Green, for your greener home. Who's the king? Work it out and you could win an amazing prize from the King Spa in Onken. From Monday to Friday, we're celebrating the King Spa's fifth birthday in style with some great prizes to be won. Check out the image on manxradio.com and fill in the competition entry form to get into the draw. Then be listening at 5pm on Friday to see if you're our weekly winner. Don't miss your chance to be treated like royalty. Who's the king? Every weekday with the King Spa Onken and your nation station, Manx Radio. The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Passed by 12 minutes before one and Stephen's with us now. Hi, Stephen. Hi, Andy. Good afternoon, listeners. I think Jason Morehouse's uh, motion, whilst being laudable and it is trying to solve a problem. I don't think it fully understands the situation of housing because there's, it's a complex situation. Certainly will not be solved by saying uh, uh, this or that. It, it will involve various solutions because, uh, because um, banks, I believe, will not lend properties Lend, lend money on old properties. You won't give mortgages for old properties that require an awful lot of investment. So there'll be lots of factors why properties remain empty. And I think uh, what we've got to remember is also the government itself stopped giving uh, grants for the uh, for the repair and maintenance and renovation of old properties. So it's got to have to be, in my view. Uh, a, a, a united approach to it, involving probably a, some of the agencies of government. It could be DOI, it could be uh, enterprise, and working in conjunction with the banks to provide the funding. Just to say that it's, an, it's the bad owner that will not uh, will not sell the property or get it back into the market is uh, is oversimplifying the issue, in my view. Uh, do you not think, I mean, obviously these owners who've got dilapidated properties or they're getting rate relief on them, they must they must have a strategy, and that is basically keeping the property as an investment. Well, not necessarily, because there's a number of properties in various areas that, uh, that do not attract buyers because of the nature of the repairs that need to be done. So consequently, people put it on the market. It doesn't tr- attract a buyer, and uh, and then it, it just gets left and left and left. It 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 is, uh, in my view, the only solution is involving a lot of different organisations, including private finance. For instance, I know some friends of mine who had to, well, were wanting to sell, but they had to get. Uh, Many different surveys done of their property in order to get it uh, get it mortgageable. So it's not quite as simple as just saying these people or the owners won't sell them. Sometimes that may be they can't sell it. Mm. So I do feel that uh, this motion, however well meaning, 
is not the complete solution to this problem. I'm all for, incidentally, solving the issue of, uh, I think I said at the meeting where you were there, that the 6,000 properties that do need to be put back into the market. But it's, it's, it's a complex uh, problem. And as I say, it will involve private finance. It will vo- involve government with grant aid. And uh, and everybody working together to solve the problem. Just simply addressing the issue of rates will not certainly not, in my view, solve it. Uh, it. It's often the case that things are best solved by market forces because uh, the heavy hand of government really isn't the uh, you know the the, the 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 most appropriate tool. So is that you mentioned? Is it government and private finance working together, or who should do it? I would think that, in my view, that would be a better way forward because, as I say I'm led to believe there's a, there's a, the banks will not lend money uh, on older properties unless they're really in tip-top condition. So we've got to try and find a mechanism to uh, to get to, uh, to solve this problem. OK. Stephen, I appreciate that. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Cheers. Now, take minutes before one. Mark's with us now. Hi, Mark. You right, Andy Fell. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Yeah, lovely day. It's not too bad at all, mate. Listen, I am... Um, Two things. One's a little bit light-hearted. We have trouble uh, uh, saying dilapidated today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those words, isn't it? You know full well you're going to pronounce it wrong. Yes. Now, um, I was talking to you, your producer about the Africa House. Oh, on now, Woodburn Road, yeah. What on earth is going on there, Andy? Uh, well, I think it's still uh, still owned by... Is it Mr Chatter? Mr Raj Chatter, I think, still owns that. Yeah, now... Uh, we were mentioning the fact that uh, they pulled down the old um, Department of Home Affairs building next door. So now if you go down uh, Woodburn Road, you've got a building site with God knows what all over the place. Uh, and then derelict building. And then you've got the Mormon Church. That is just horrible. Why on earth did they pull that DHA building down? You could have easily turned that back into flats. Because before the DHA got hold of it, that's exactly what it was. It was a, a, a block of Victorian flats. Yeah, and I remember when the civil defence used to be in in there as well. They'd still got beautiful staircases and everything. Oh, yeah. It's all its all like Italian, um, not marble, what's it called? You know, t- tiles and stuff like that all yeah. over the place. It was a gorgeous building. You, you know, everyone's complaining that there's no properties, there's no places. That we used to, when I was a kid, that used to have 10 flats in it. There is no reason on earth for him to pull it down, none at all. And I think that somebody needs to do a compulsory purchase on Africa House. I mean, poor Trevor must be turning in his, you know, turning in his grave thinking about what they've done to his house. Because I've been in that house loads of times. I knew Trevor's wife very well, and the house was just, oh, I mean, you could, it was. It's heartbreaking, to be honest with you, Andy. It's heartbreaking just looking at what they've let happen to the whole the whole place. It was just beautiful. Well, there used to be a thing. I don't know whether it's still in operation. Is it called a Section 24 notice, uh, an S24, yeah. which means you have to do the works are required, and if they're not completed, then further measures are taken. So, and presumably, they served an S24 on Africa House. Well, I used to work for um, uh, the council many, many years ago, and uh, when I was there, I did talk about it a few... Now, by what I can remember, I mean, my memory's a bit hazy these days, so I'm getting on a bit. Um, they served a number of them on him, and he just ignored them. He pays the fine, and that's the end of the matter. Um, the the, the rumour mongers, you know, you know what Max Skeet's like, you know, you take some of it with a pinch of salt, but the rumour mill was that he was wanting to demolish it and build four... Two million pound mansions on the on the site, but right. the people around there, you know, because you've got the Mormon Church, then you've got uh, those lovely little Georgian terrace at the back of it. Uh, everyone objected, and they said no. So he just said, "Right, I'll let it go to rack and ruin." And also, at the back there's Africa Court, that little cul-de-sac of of uh, small houses, yeah. isn't there? They're, yeah, they're brand new. They're nice little houses, but yeah. I mean, the, the only way to get access to Africa House is either to block off Woodburn Road or block off Africa Court. So the only way that he's going to get anything built there is to literally inconvenience people. For I don't think he cares. I just think he pays the the Section 24 fine and he'll just let it all rot and fall down and we will end up with a great big hole in the ground and it just doesn't do anything for anyone. It's just sad, Andy. It's just sad. Yeah, uh, it, it isn't. I mean, it's not the best outcome, but of course, when you have people who have substantial means at their, at their um, uh, you know, uh, available, they don't need to do anything, no. so they don't do anything. Well, 
from what I can gather, this guy owns a massive big property in Dubai. He also owns several properties in Hong Kong and India. And, I mean, if that's the case, a tiny little £2 million house on the Isle of Man isn't going to even uh, make a dent in his pocket money, is it? Well, we wait and see, Mark. Thanks for being with us. No problem, my friend. Have a good afternoon. Good to hear from you. Thanks for that. In the next couple of... We're open line for the rest of this week for uh, Thursday and Friday. And uh, next week, uh, four-day week, of course, because of Senior Race Day, Bank Holiday, although Senior Race Day is on the Saturday. Uh, So we're open line all next week. Week after that, we're going to be live with the students of Castle Russian High School, Tuesday 13th in Castletown. We're back inside the schools. And also... uh, that week. Um, it must be a fortnight tomorrow, the 15th of June. Sarah Maltby MHK and Victoria McLaughlin who is the Director of Social Security Benefits. Social Security Director brackets, benefits, close brackets Victoria McLaughlin and Sarah Maltby and we'll be talking about benefits. We'll be talking about how benefits work how they should work, how they are working, and if you have any queries, questions, or points you want to make about benefits, then we'd love to hear from you. That's Thursday the 15th, fortnight tomorrow. Uh, Sarah Maltby, MHK, Victoria McLaughlin, Social Security Director, we will be talking about benefits. Uh, You may have discussed this already, says Sue and Kurt Michael, uh, but I don't have many chances to listen to the show. Uh, But I do watch, uh, did watch The Last of Maryland, and I was saddened by the fact that the majority of the program uh, about the Isle of Man was filmed off the Isle of Man. I believe it's uh, due to the government not offering financial backing. What a huge missed opportunity to promote the Isle of Man and show it off in all its glory. Visitors uh, will now come here expecting uh, to a lake to wild swim in and a cafe on the beach and the prom with metal railings. We have similar but not what was filmed. I hope the Manx government realises it was a mistake. I'd like to know what they're spending our money on. Is it certainly not being spent on the majority of things that we do need spending money on, says Sue. Uh, I don't know whether you... So thank you, Sue, for that. I don't know whether you saw Maryland, what your thought about Maryland was, and whether or not this is something we should be doing more of in the future. That's it for Man in Line today. Thanks to Howie on the phones. If you want to get in touch, email maninline at manxradio.com out of hours, or you can call the answer phone on 682 631. Stick around, Christy is on the way. W I N T.